Right. Uh, good morning, all, and it is all, because I think every single person in the room I know. Uh, when uh, it was suggested that I contribute today, uh, I immediately told Erin that I was not up to doing uh, the research uh, side of things. So my task this morning is simply to introduce the day and to introduce Margaret to us uh, without being based on a great deal of research. However, I have been helped by uh, talking to a number of people uh, and uh, those thoughts are incorporated, but I won't name them. Uh, and the um, and also by uh, help from uh, Robert Tong, who produced this uh, outline that you've been given. You'll notice that it finishes at an odd point, namely 2007. Uh, the reason is that the outline was uh, to support uh, her nomination to become AM. And uh, so Robert did background work for that. And uh, it's an excellent document that we have just to help us to have the outline of uh, Margaret's life. Uh, why don't I pray at this point as well and ask for the Lord's blessing. Dear God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you very much indeed that we're able to gather today. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for our dear sister, Margaret, and we pray that today we'll do her justice. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the passion with which she served you and for the fruitfulness of her life. And so we commit ourselves and uh, with thankfulness for her memory, into your gracious hands, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And uh, for those who knew Margaret particularly well, and there are a number of here, may I apologise in advance because you're going to say, really? She wasn't like that at all, and so forth and so on. And if only he really knew what he was talking about, I can hear you saying it now, I apologise in advance. This is just a beginning. Okay, here we go. This is the thing. Eulogies have their value. They are moments when we express and discuss and minister to grief. They recreate the person in a way which we can be thankful for them. They are like a beautiful portrait in which it is truly the person we are remembering but with no wrinkles no ill points on view. In the case of someone who has played a distinguished public role, there emerges the next stage some years on, a stage which we have reached today, when critical history emerges. By critical, I don't, of course, mean nasty or uh, opposed. What I mean is that here, at a distance from Margaret, uh, 10 years almost now, uh, we have the opportunity for a more considered judgment, for thoughtful description, for context, for assessment of the contribution made, uh, for talking about the institutions she was part of and the movements which she was part of as well. And that is why I'm so glad that we are here today. It's a very good time to be doing it. And uh, may it just, in a sense, be the beginning of the assessment and the writing of Margaret's life to reflect on our friend, Margaret Rogers. She is worthy of our memory and the ongoing memory of our diocese and the churches beyond. She made a lasting contribution to movements, institutions, and to other people, both here and in the worldwide communion, a contribution recognized by becoming a member of the Order of Australia in 2014 as we can see. She helped make us who we are, and it is altogether appropriate that we should begin the task of assessing her person, her times, and her achievements. It's what she would be doing. For our motive is not merely to reflect on a friend. We do well to think of our saints and heroes of earlier times and never to forget them. They create our narrative, and their stories enable us to live Christianly in our own day. The life of Margaret is one which must not be forgotten in our time and the time beyond, for it is part of the fabric of our history, and our history makes us. My task is merely to introduce the day. Others will give papers which will make history. This one can be forgotten. 
Thus, I'm going to attempt to give a brief outline, first of Margaret's life, second her ministry, and third of her person. So her life. As far as an outline of Margaret's life is concerned, I'm blessed to have access to a document prepared by Dr. Robert Tong, uh, submitted in support of her AM, and also a biographical contribution uh, by Dr. Rod Benson to the Evangelical Dictionary of Biography, which I've also got access to. Thank you. Margaret was born in Dorigo in, in late 1939 and died in Sydney on the 31st of May uh, 2014. That she was granted over 70 years of life was pretty wonderful in the sense of her health from teenage years, which was severely compromised through rheumatic fever and a two-year stint in hospital. She did well at school and more than well, and when she entered Deaconess House, she achieved her THL with honours and then later graduated from the University of Sydney with a BA. And in 1977, to cap it, she was awarded the Bachelor of Divinity, not an easy award to achieve, a Bachelor of Divinity with honours from Sydney. Uh, in my mind, had opportunity allowed, she could have course gone on to further study. Margaret taught history, I think one of her loves, and divinity at Abbotsley and Meriden, and was ordained deaconess in 1970. From 1969, she began to tutor at Deaconess House, and in 1973, she became warden of an institution that, oh, actually, as I look around the room, a number of people in this room will remember, but it is probably back in history, namely the Church of England Women's Hall in Glebe. I won't ask you to wave at me if you remember it, but we certainly remember it from our days at St Barnabas Broadway. Between 1976 and 1984, she was the principal of Deaconess House and lectured in church history at Moore and then moved to General Synod Office as Administration and Research Officer. An interesting career shift. In 1994, however, she succeeded Charlotte Rivers as the CEO of Anglican Media. And in 2004, and I'm not quite sure what this shift meant as it didn't seem to mean much to me, uh, she became the Archbishop's Media Officer. When I say that, I mean I thought she was already, but anyhow, <laughs> there we are. A post she retired from in 2007. Now, that's merely the outline, and uh, it can be filled in a little bit more by looking at uh, what Robert Tong has done for us there. Uh, time does not permit to describe, uh, <laughs> you can see some of them here, all the committees and boards of which she was a member. Uh, she was, for example, uh, her church was St Stephen's Newtown, of which she was church warden, nominator, reader, and synod representative. That would be typical of just some of the things that Margaret did and got up to. She was a pretty prominent member of the Sydney Synod and the first woman to be elected to the Sydney Standing Committee. She was also on the General Synod, its Standing Committee, and its Doctrine Commission. She served on the National Council of Churches, something I didn't know or didn't remember, uh, and the Anglican Consultative Council, that's the Anglican Communion's Anglican Consultative Council, and was joint president of the Christian Council of Asia, and also a delegate to the World Council of Churches, particularly the meeting was held in Canberra. She was a board member of World Vision, chair of the New College Board, and that's, it goes on. She was very much involved in being part of the institutional structures, not only of this diocese, but of the Australian church and well beyond. There's a, quite an international flair to all this. Uh, she wrote, she broadcast over radio 2CH for 13 years, and she was my media officer. But the list of committees and jobs hardly tells the story. How can we best describe her? 
and so her ministry. My own guess is that Margaret had her struggles and these helped define her. Notice guess. My own guess is that Margaret had her struggles and these helped define her and make her the person she was. The first and ongoing struggle was, of course, her health. Uh, she did not discuss this with me in depth, at least I don't remember she did, but I was certainly under the impression at the time that she was not expecting to live long. And uh, that must have had a large impact on her and her thinking. She would have been vulnerable on that account and have developed ways of coping and part of her personality, I think, must have been related to that. Uh, not in a negative way, but uh, I think that must have made her part of who she was. So that was the first struggle. Second struggle. She was, in a way that is almost unimaginable now, I suppose, a woman in a man's world. In this, she pioneered, as far as local uh, now things are concerned, she pioneered the path of women in the area of theological education and church politics in a way which was notably different from her distinguished predecessor, Mary Andrews. Two great women, but I think pretty different, one way or another. Well, sort of different. I think they were both quite capable of speaking and speaking their minds. She took such practical steps as no longer regarding requiring the women students to wear a uniform. What a great day that was. She had the academic skills to teach at Moore College and she worked hard at integrating the women into the experience of Moore while retaining the distinctives of a time at Deaconess House. In my memory, she became, in essence, a faculty member of Moore. I was not the principal in those days, uh, so we did not coexist as principals. But in my memory, she became a, a member of the faculty. And I well remember, for example, attending a faculty conference with Margaret there, presumably the only woman in the room, the rest of the faculty was there, and Margaret having a fair amount of influence in the room. So much so that a decision was made, and I think it was she who pushed it, that the men would no longer wear academic gowns. If I uh, tell you that the minute we came back to the conference, Dr Knox hadn't been able to be there, and the decision was completely overruled and reversed, you will understand the nature of the hierarchy in those days. Uh, it made no difference. Uh, Dr Knox didn't mind his curates making whatever decisions they like, as long as he made the actual decision. But my memory is that Margaret had a fair bit to say at that conference one way or another about that and other things, no doubt. Um, as a woman, she was on her own in a masculine faculty, but there is no doubt that she held her own. She was preparing the students, her students in Deke House, for a new world of women's ministry and doubtless, in her own mind, the ordination of women and their leadership role in the churches. All this involved change and frequently change that was not welcomed. Second struggle. Third struggle. She was a Christian in an increasingly unbelieving world. Like us all, she was navigating the waters of secularism and seeking ways to promote the gospel of Jesus and to guard the faith against the assaults of unbelief. Nor was this simply in the world. Margaret was, without doubt, an evangelical Christian from the small outpost which is Sydney. Her career took her to the four corners of the world and to the need to retain and promote the biblical faith amongst church people with wildly different ideas. She was present, of course, at the birth of the increasingly belligerent Episcopal liberalism, uh, and she was observer at the last great Lambeth conference in 1998, <laughs> where that liberalism came head to head with the orthodox conservatism of so much of the rest of the Anglican communion. How would you describe the ministry of this woman in her context, and those struggles? I think you would say, first of all, 
be interesting to know how people in this room would finish that sentence. I, because <laughs> you may well differ. Here's my end of the sentence. I think you would say, need to say, first of all, that Margaret was a teacher. Several people have mentioned her teaching skills. Someone who was at college in uh, the late 60s had Margaret as a tutor. It was a significant step forward for Deaconess House, and Margaret took the tutorial method that she was baptised in at the university and applied it at the college. She got students to write essays, which were discussed and critiqued, not something that was happening then for the most, most of the men's students. My informant has told me how well it was done and with excellent results for the standard of the women students. Others have mentioned to me, <coughs> I beg your pardon, others have mentioned to me one-to-one -one teaching, which they received and benefited from immensely. She was a teacher. Next, I would say that she was, without doubt, intellectually highly gifted. She researched. She spoke and wrote with considerable skill. In 1996, for example, she delivered one of the significant Halifax Portal lectures, uh, which are reserved for the top grade people giving the lectures, uh, on the subject of, quote, I wonder what you, whether, what you would guess would be her subject, the Ministry of Women, boldly observing in the beginning of the lecture, quote, I am pleased to be part of this series, though the only woman lecturer in, uh, at, at this time. In our 1996 context, I find that a little dismaying. I am pleased to be speaking on my chosen topic, a seminal series without due consideration of one of the most pressing ecclesiastical issues of our time would have had far less credibility. I wonder if you can hear Margaret in those, uh, not with my voice, but I think you can hear Margaret in what she was saying right up front at that point. And she concludes the lecture with, uh, or towards the end with these words, but it is finally not debate which wins supporters to acceptance of women's ministry. It is the genuine experience of women ministering in the congregation and amongst the people of God. It's a fine essay, uh, which I had the pleasure of reading again recently. As I've already noted, had she wanted to go further into academic work, there is no doubt that she could have done so. Presumably her job at the General Synod Office involved research. I don't know, because uh, that, that's a bit of a blank period for me as far as she was concerned. But I suspect it also involved the international elements, international elements of her career, which I've already alluded to. Perhaps she was too busy doing good works to give years to academic work of doing the PhD grind, and who can blame her, but I don't know. Thirdly, so a teacher, uh, she was intellectual, but thirdly, I would say that she was a pioneer. At a time when few in Sydney were especially interested in ecumenical affairs, I'm not sure if that has changed, or the Anglican Communion, I think that has, she became deeply involved and her experiences helped mould her. She forged friendships and connections outside of our small world. She was prepared to engage in theological debates. She changed the direction of the education of women and the expectations that went with it. She advanced into places into which the next generation of women could and would go. She led the way not least into the political life of the church and was never shy, not even if it may have made her unpopular at a time of considerable political turmoil, she was never shy uh, to let her views be known, especially about the role of women. Thus, for example, people remember and have mentioned to me a powerful speech she made at a conference in the mid-90s, a conference I well remember, held at Trinity Grammar School, a conference at which I, for one, as principal of Moore College, spoke on the other side. I can guess who won that contest. I mean, Margaret, of course. You understand <laughs> that? <laughs> just want to make sure. Okay. Oh, I see. You all just took it for granted. Yes, I get it. Okay. Now, her person. But who was she as a person? 
Let me remind you at this point that all I say is somewhat suppositional. Margaret was a friend and a cherished friend and an important colleague of mine. But I wouldn't regard her as a close personal friend. Uh, and in this section in particular, I may well be speaking out of turn and there are people here who are very close personal friends of Margaret and who may feel that what I'm saying is either not true or uh, far from the whole picture. Uh, nonetheless, let me at least raise the subject and begin the task of painting the portrait. Despite the fact that she was a deaconess and interestingly did not seek ordination to the diaconate as far as I know, I did not think of Margaret as a parish worker as such. No doubt she would have done that ministry very well had she, ha, had she chosen to do so, but her interests always seemed to be other. In personality, she was self-contained, which may have something to do with the health issue, of course. Not especially warm to colleagues. I don't mean she was unfriendly or anything like that, but she was self-contained. Was not much prone to small talk and did not suffer fools gladly. I don't mean she was not interested in other people, she was, or that she was selfish or egotistical, far from it. Indeed, and this is testified by a number of people whose stories I've heard, uh, she was a kind person. But she's also been described as feisty, and I guess that refers to the fact that she was never shy, no, not even for a moment, in taking on any opposition in debate. She fought with the best of them. For some people, the wars they fight shape them and shape them forever. We can even become obsessive about the things we are standing for. Remember that I, fought, I suggested that Margaret fought three battles, one about ill health, one about the restrictions on min women's ministry, and thirdly, about the secular world. It would be very easy indeed for the struggles about women in ministry to have dominated and obsessed her. But, and I don't say this romantically, so to speak, I think it was the gospel of Jesus which held her heart first and foremost, and that is what explains her best. And we've got to remember that. That's really the issue. She truly believed other things, but she wasn't so obsessed that she forgot Jesus. That's how I'd say. And that's not easy, but that was Margaret. I say that as one who had the great privilege of working with her for six years in the media field, and we'll hear more about this. She was not trained in media work, but that did not stop Margaret. She was working with a notoriously complementarian archbishop, but that did not stop Margaret. Her knowledge, her skills, her loyalty, her personal loyalty, her loyalty to the gospel and to the church as well, her loyalty, her strength, were all put at the service of the gospel of Jesus and all put to the task of helping a hopeless amateur cope with the sharp shark pool of the media. You know who the helpless amateur was, I hope. No humble servant she, let me say. She never ceased to be the feisty, intelligent, savvy, experienced Margaret. One of my fondest memories of her is a comment made to me after I was interviewed by a lady reporter. Peter, you're a sucker for a you're a sucker for a pretty face. <laughs> Not much respect for the Archbishop of Sydney from whose media officer. That was Margaret. Conclusion. Uh, there are eulogies and then there's history. But the eulogies themselves are part of the history and I have no hesitation therefore in closing with my part of the sermon I preached at her funeral in 2014, part of it, for I was given the huge privilege. Um, I don't say I was 
totally surprised, but I was so deeply honoured and, in a sense, surprised that I should be the one, but I was, uh, of preaching on that occasion. And so this is what I said. I love the portrait of Margaret, which adorns our service sheets today, and rightly so, your eyes have gone to that portrait because that's the one I'm talking about. And I love it. Uh, I'm not so fond of the one we had on our piece of paper today because I didn't recognise it, but people better than I have said, yes, of course, that's Margaret. <laughs> so there we are. But I love that one. Uh, the jacket is elegant. The award is rightly prominent and well-deserved. It gives you the chance to rejoice again, as all her friends did when we heard that she had been given the AM. And the face is, to my mind, Margaret. Smiling, quizzical, welcoming, and yet seeing right into your very soul at the same time. Peter, you're a sucker for a pretty face. Our lives intertwined over many years. Carillion Avenue, Abbotsley, the General Synod, there were many committees and synods of which she was so prominent a member, abounding in the work of the Lord. Even when we disagreed, we were allies because we sought the same things and served the same master. But we were not merely colleagues. In fact, I don't think Margaret would recognise that category in many of her relationships. We were friends, for she had the gift of friendship in abundance. Imagine my gratitude then when Margaret continued her role as media officer after serving in that capacity during the time of Archbishop Goodhue. To say that the task was a difficult one would be to underestimate the challenges. How could we best promote the interests of Christ in a media world where ignorance was endemic, skepticism, skepticism normal, and opposition rife? Margaret was not trained for this role specifically, but she brought to it vital gifts which transcended any lacks. And I concluded the eulogy part of the sermon with these words. First, she was committed to Christ and his word. Second, she had the shrewdness which comes from spiritual wisdom. Third, she had a very significant experience of the Anglican and Christian world beyond Sydney, the national church and the international church, especially Asia. Fourth, she was tough-minded and somewhat unflappable. Fifth, she had the loyalty which speaks its own mind. Sixth, with her capacity for friendship, she saw beyond the media as such and cultivated the people who work in the media. She introduced me to their world and helped me to move beyond merely stereotypical responses to what is said to, what is said, to relate to the actual people who were reporting the news. Seventh, she inducted me into the special role of the Archbishop in the community, a role which is hard to understand until you're actually in place. She helped me to see the importance of justice for the poor and the dispossessed. For all this and much more, I owe my gratitude in a way which could never be fully recounted. I thank God for Margaret.